Okay, for today, we started by reviewing a little bit of top 20 because the top 20 test is coming in a couple days. Uh, but now we're going to get into the new stuff. The new stuff is about inverses. And yesterday we did inverses, but we really didn't talk that much about their domains and ranges. And I want to talk about that briefly. All right, so first of all, I submit to you Exhibit A. What, if it's not been stretched or anything, is the equation for that? I equals x squared. Would you please tell me its domain and range after you've graphed it? I will pause for a second while you graph your classic parabola and figure out its domain and range. Negative infinity, positive infinity for the domain. The range would be 0 to infinity. And it can be 0, so you need a bracket there. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, without even figuring out what it is, I could say this has an inverse because, you know what? Everything has an inverse. Every function that exists has an inverse. The inverse, the only one that would be weird is y equals x because that is the line you reflect over. So how would it, its inverse be? Well, it's kind of like the, the number 1. Does 1 have an inverse? It's 1 over 1, which is 1. So it has an inverse. It just happens to be the same as itself. That would be the only exception. Anyway, so what's the inverse of this? Well, I don't even know, but I actually do know. But if, if I don't know yet, I can still tell you that if I draw it in blue, the domain and the range of the inverse are easy to figure out. Do you remember what I said yesterday about this? You flip them. Because the x's and y's flip places, the domain becomes a range and the range becomes a domain. Please go ahead and write the domain and range of the new function that you don't even know yet. We did talk about this one briefly yesterday. If I put in the line y equals x, it's a reflection across that line that gives me this new function. And if I reflect just this part over the line, it kind of helps me see where it's going to go. I just, I just reflected this little part right here across that line. And that helped me to see, oh, it's going to look like this. And do you remember what the equation of that guy is? I'm going to choose to write it in the same order. Instead of y, I'm going to start with x. Equals instead of x, I'm going to say y squared, because that's exactly what you do when you make an inverse, is you swap x and y. So x equals y squared is the inverse. But I don't let you leave it that way. I make you solve it for y. Would you please solve that for y? It's not solved for y. Right now it's solved for x. And I want to talk about the ramifications of that. Solve that for y. I'll pause while you try that. So here it comes again. I told you hey, we were going to do this like 5,000 times. You do the square root of this, and do you remember that that means the square root of y squared is not just y? It's what? Absolute value of y is equal to the square root of x. I don't need to do anything fancy with the square root of x. I can just leave it as the square root of x. I'm not asking to take it out of its square root. It's in a square root. Okay, now, this absolute value of y breaks into two equations then. y would equal square root of x, just like you'd see it without the absolute value bars. And then y equals negative of the square root of x. And I want you to think about that. Do you get it is made up, the blue one there, is made up of two square root functions. One of them's like right here. That's the normal square root. And then one of them is a reflected square root because it's got, you know, negative in front of it right here. So it's a reflected square root. This guy right here is the reflected square root. And what does it mean when you give a function and it takes two y equal equations to describe it? Do you remember that deal? If it takes two equations to describe it, then what do you know? not a function. 
And I also could have told this is not a function, the blue one is not a function, because it wouldn't have passed the vertical line test. See, it fails the vertical line test in a million places. All right, so moral of the story. When you have a function and you create its inverse, it does not always come out to be a function. Its inverse will exist, but its inverse won't always be a function. Now, there are special functions where when they do their inverse, their inverse is also a function, and so they get a special name. It's called a one-to-one -one function. Was x squared a one-to-one -one function? No, because when we made its inverse, its inverse wasn't a function. But there are some functions where when you create its inverse, the inverse is also a function. And therefore, it's kind of like, it's almost like a parent and a child both being perfect. They both are functions. The x squared, it's not a one-to-one -one function. All right. So, I think we are ready. If I've summed up enough of this, I want to go over one thing just to make sure this is stuck in your mind. What if I do uh, R of M of X? What would be that little formula for figuring out its domain? We're not actually going to do the domain. I just want you to see if you can remember the formula for it. Did you start with the domain of R? No, you should not have. Very good. You start with the domain that's on the inside. So domain of M. And then what little symbol is next? Intersect, upside down U. And then which letter comes next? M in the other domain. Domain of R. Okay, good. So that's the one of the hardest things to remember. I think since it's up, I think it's best if I just take a second and do one with you that's like this. We'll make it really simple. R of x is equal to 2x plus 5, but x is artificially limited to be bigger than 8. And uh, it, that's the domain, by the way. And then the m of x function is uh, x squared plus 2, where x is artificially told to be less than 3. Then my question is, what's the domain of this new nested function, r of m of x? I'll pause for a second. Let me give that one a try. Okay, let's see if you're on the right track here. D of M is right there. It says it. X is less than 3. I'm going to make a number line for it because I like to see it. There. Notice it's open at the 3. Okay, next. M is this guy in that. So then I'm saying X squared plus 2 goes into that other equation. X greater than 8, so then I just say greater than 8. Now I'm going to subtract 2, and then I'm going to x squared is greater than 6, and then I can solve that square root, square root, and hopefully I've pounded it in hard enough that you now know that its absolute value of x is greater than, sorry, uh, square root of 6, and that means there's two answers. Absolute value of x breaks into x is greater than square root of 6, and x is less than negative square root of 6. I don't even know what the square root of 6 is. I, I can tell you this. It's bigger than the square root of 4, which would be 2, right? So that's about 2 point something. All right, so now I'm going to make a number line for this. You think there's a mistake in it yet? You got a concern that it... Go ahead. All right, 
the reason that this switches is I think your question. Is that really what you're asking is why does that switch? Okay, so that sign switched because we made this the opposite of what it was. Uh, I guess I, a way to think of it is this. When you're solving something like this, do you get that when you make this side the opposite of what it was by dividing by negative 2. Do you remember that that makes the signs switch? It's kind of like that. This makes this less than turn into a greater than when you involve an opposite of. You made that side the opposite of what it was. Bottom line, I can just show you that it works. You can trust that after you see an example that it will work. If I just say x uh, squared, I want it to be less than 1. And what I'm telling you is that square root, square root, absolute value of x is less than 1, because square root of 1 is still 1, right? That breaks into x is less than 1 and x is greater than negative 1. I think if I go back to the original here, you'll get that if I want x squared to be less than 1, it's got to be between here's 1 and here's negative 1. And it's got to be something in between that if it's going to be stay less than 1. So does it make sense to you that it should split into those two? All right. Try to show you an example of why it would. But now I just have to tell you, that's how it works. You do the opposite sign here, and therefore you need the opposite sign there. If you make something the opposite, then you got to switch it to the other sign. Okay, so final answer. I got to put this on the number line. I got square root of 6, and I, or negative square root of 6, and I got positive square root of 6. And like I said, they're in the neighborhood of, of uh, 2 point something. And it can't be them, but it's got to be less than, ooh, this one's less than the negative one, and bigger than the positive one, which is like that. Okay. Now I'm going to take that and overlap it with this original d of m right here. So I'm going to move it down. Oh, nuts. Uh, lock them together or group them together again. And bring this down here. Scroll up. There we go. And 3 would be, let me see, that's 2. It's like 2 point something. So 3 would be like right here. So then where do they overlap? I better extend this out. It goes forever this way, right? So then... Where does it overlap? It overlaps in there, not including the endpoints. And it overlaps in here. So this one was a tricky one. Final answer, negative infinity until negative root 6. Doesn't touch at root 6 because it's an open spot. And then between positive root 6, which we know is like 2 point something, and 3, and doesn't touch on either end, you put a union between them. That is probably more intense than anything you'd see on the test. But that's how to do one of those nested domains. I think it's two days in a row where we've really hammered that, so probably won't talk about that much, too much more. Any questions about that? All right. It got pretty intense. You're in an intense class. Let's uh, now look at the file for today. Today is 10-3. I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, so uh, we're going to focus next on the lab. The lab that I'm assigning uh, is called Mad Mouse. And uh, you'd want the PDF version of it. I'm personally opening the notebook because I can do that. Uh, and let's talk through uh, some of the features of this lab. Number one, you're going to use a graphing calculator the entire time. And I encourage you, if you have one with you, take out your graphing calculator right now. So I want you to picture uh, the finished product on this. The finished product on this, it is on your calculator. You hit graph. And it graphs three functions. This will be one of your y equals. This will be another one. 
and this will be the third one, and those three equations that are in your calculator will all mesh perfectly together. They won't have any gaps because if this is really supposed to be a roller coaster and there's a gap in it, you'd have a problem, right? And so when it's all done, you're going to type those into your calculator and hit graph, and they should make a nice, perfect, like it shouldn't have any gaps in between it at all. So how do you get a equation to stop working like here? Like this is a parabola. This middle part's a parabola. How do you get it to stop working? How do you get, like, wouldn't a parabola keep going forever? You set your domain. Very good. Let's try to do that on the graphing calculator. So just go to y equals, and I'd like you to see if you can figure out how to make a parabola stop, like, on both sides of it. So first of all, we'll just we'll just graph a parabola. I'm going to pause while I get my graphing calculator up. All right, so I've graphed a regular parabola, y equals x squared. And what if I wanted it to stop? Stop being a parabola after in between, except in between those two lines. Like, let's say it, I want it to be from here, which is x is 2, to here, which is, or sorry, one of them is negative 2, one of them is 2. I want it to stop. Don't go forever. Any ideas? Tell me what, what you wish you could tell the calculator in words. You want to tell it the domain, okay? What's the domain about? What letter is it about, X or Y? Domain is about the X's. You want to somehow tell it what about the X's? How about, instead of telling it where to stop, how about we tell it where to go? We want it to go between, what? Negative 2 and 2. I don't have any programmers in here who could think of a, a way to do this. Yes? Okay. So above math, there's a thing called test. It does give you all the symbols. Okay. That has to do with it. You're warm. But I got to tell the calculator back on the graphing screen to do this. Ever had somebody tell you a riddle and not tell you the answer? Just annoys the heck out of you. Yep, you have. <laughs> because I just did. See if you can figure it out. Somebody smart in here is going to figure this out. And I think it'd be good for you to just play with it. There's stuff you can do that'll make it stop. And somebody's going to figure it out and they're going to be proud of themselves. Don't spend more than like 10, 15 minutes messing with this. You don't have to. I'm just going to throw it out there as a challenge. If I can make this parabola stop and only do its thing between negative 2 and 2, that would be pretty cool. All right. So let's go back to our lab. I'll tell you more about that tomorrow. If nobody figures it, I'll tell you. But I think it's good for you guys to be challenged sometimes. I mean, you like to rise to the occasion. All right. Do you agree that this function, if I let it run wild, would be a parabola that would go forever, and I needed somehow cut it off there, right? But do you also agree it's a parabola that has been moved up? Now let's let's read over what they want to be like for sure the rules on this. All right, line AB. Oh, right away, I know that's a straight line. That means it's based on y equals x. Yes, sir? You figured it out. All right. So tell me your fix. I mean, just to clarify, there might be more than one fix. Somebody thinks they got it already. What did you do? You put in parentheses after it. 
First, I have to get down there. Okay, parentheses, x, second math. That's the testing. Did you want great? Did you start with greater than or equal to? Yeah. Okay. No, no, that's fine. X is greater than or equal to. Wasn't it negative two? Okay, so negative two. X is greater or equal to negative two. X test is. Was it less than or equal to now? Less than or equal to two. Enter. Now if I say graph, there it goes. It stopped it. Okay, now some of yours that have the older operating system, they have to connect these lines or they will go insane, so they connect the lines with that and that. I will understand that if you have an old, the older operating system and it connects those lines. It wants to stay continuous. I wish it wouldn't do anything except what's in between, but it does draw that little line at the bottom there. All right, cool. Now, do you get that my roller coaster is going to have something like that in it? Except I'm going to want it to move up a little bit because I want it to stay off the ground. Wouldn't it be easy to move this thing up? I hope you remember the transformation thingies. So if I want to move this up, and one of the important things to remember at this point is the insert key. I'm going to insert a plus 5 here. It's right above the delete key is INF. To insert, to move this thing up, now I hit graph, and now it's moved up. Whoa. Why did it do that other one? Okay. I'm going to go back here. I wonder if I need to put that all in parentheses or something after it. I know what it's doing. It's multiplying my domains by 5. So, yeah. Let's see if I can insert an extra set of parentheses. Did that work? Not there. Not there. I didn't mean there. Hold on. Go there. Insert an extra set of parentheses. And I bet it'll work. Nope. Put parentheses around the equation. Okay. Insert. Hold on. You know what this lab is like? This lab is like this. A ton of, okay, I got to try to make this work. Now I got to move it over a little bit. Now I got to, oh, something's messed up. Now I'm going to, does anybody know if you need those outside parentheses around the domain? No. You don't need them? All right, thank you. And now I'm going to go to the end. And then delete off that. And then hit graph. All right. There we go. And now I'd have to move it to the right. I think you get the idea. Okay. Yeah, on the inside, it moves you to the right. Like minus 5 or something, we move it to 5 to the right. All right. So that's what it's like. You're playing around with that. And then... Let's, let's do one piece that kind of goes with that. This square root here, that's a square root function that's been moved. It used to be like here, right? And then it got moved to the right and up. See what I'm saying? Okay. So I go to my calculator, and I go on y sub 2 or y sub 3. It doesn't matter which one's which. Now I'm going to make that square root function. Here's a square root of x, except I know it's to the right, so I'm going to make it to go to the right right away. I'll just see if I do it the right amount to the right. 
Let's say I go five to the right, and then I go outside of that. And I also want it up some. Let's say I go up seven. And then I hit graph. Well, there it is, but they aren't connecting up real well. See what I mean? Now I'm going to have to probably, maybe I should move the blue one to the right and the red one up a little bit. Do you get what I'm trying to say here? And what are the hardest part is to getting them to touch each other. Okay, getting them to be like right on top of each other. With a lot of trial and error, you can figure it out. Or you can actually use math to figure it out. How do I get two equations and figure out where they're equal to each other? I want to set two equations to touch each other. All right. Now, you can do it by guess and check. It's not going to be the end of the world if you do that, but there is a smart way that some kids are going to figure out that you can make these touch each other. Now, this is an important moment where I have to, even though I'm very tempted to just say, see, look how you can do this. It would be really easy if you just did this. If I just tell you what to do, then you aren't actually discovering anything. Some of our labs are going to be kind of frustrating that way. Because I'm not telling you exactly what to do. And, and that's part of my job is to keep my mouth shut. I want to tell you. Okay, but then you won't actually like learn to figure out stuff. You know what I mean? If somebody tells you everything and then all of a sudden you go on the job and then they say, hey, figure out this really hard thing. You can't just say, well, tell me exactly what to do. Because it's never been done before. You have to figure it out. Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, later this uh, semester, I'm going to go out uh, with you outside, and I'm going to be flying my drone at a certain height. I'll know how high it is, and I'm going to say to you, figure out how high it is. And you'll be like, well, how am I supposed to know that? You can figure it out. And at first, you're going to mind it just kind of go crazy, like, well, oh, my yeah, that's ridiculous. I'm, I can't figure out. How am I supposed to know how? And then you'll figure out that I'm not going to tell you. And then you're going to figure out that you probably, I'll probably throw out the one hint that you could draw a triangle. Figure out if you drew a triangle by just, and again, i got to be really careful. I don't tell you too much. And all of a sudden, you'll just know what to do. You have to figure it out yourself. So, that's these labs. It's an important part of the lab is that I don't tell you exactly what to do. You have to kind of discover some, some stuff. So you do have to follow these directions. And here's the only things that they tell you uh, is that the track at point A is 30 meters high. Okay. Well, it has to be 30 right there. So in other words, when you start your roller coaster, the beginning has to start at 30. And I will check for that for sure. So we'll look on your graph and see if it really starts at 30 or not. Okay. Next thing. B and C, as in where this thing stops, are at 30 meters high. Wait, wait. 10 meters high. Sorry. There it is. B and C are 10 meters high. That's at 10. See? Hint. Y equals 10 would intersect with it there. And then, last but not least, point D is 25 meters above ground level with a nearly zero slope. Do you get if this is really a roller coaster, it should be pretty flat at the end so the car can slow down and people can get out of it and stuff. You don't do that on a hill. You do that on a flat spot. Okay, so at the end of your roller coaster, it needs to be pretty flat. And it wants it at height of 25 for the roller coaster to be done. Those are the things we're going to be looking for. It doesn't mean a certain function has to look exactly this way. Some people are going to make this steeper or narrower than others, and it doesn't say you can't. As long as you do everything it says, those little requirements, then that's good enough. All right, so if I were you, I'd probably start getting my parabola. We already got it on the screen, right? I get my parabola budged over so that it hits right here at a heights of 10. Okay, 
And then I might make my other pieces to fit it, like the square root. Just make it, figure out how to get the square root moved over so that it hits exactly there. Doesn't say anything about these numbers. You can pick those numbers. So again, I can't mark it wrong if a kid uses, you know, 5, 10, 15, and that's fine. But if those don't, aren't working nice for you, you can pick anything you want. So you can use any numbers you want across the bottom. All right. And when it's all done, uh, what's in your calculator can be a big part of your final answer. But you have to finish by doing all the steps, which is state the purpose in your own words. Remember that I won't give you credit for just retyping exactly what they said. I want you to be say, think about what you're supposed to do and then say it in your own words. And then sketch. You may, in this case, take a picture of your graphing calculator as your sketch, but I would warn you that the sketches always say that it has to be labeled. If your calculator isn't labeled on the X and on the Y, you better draw it in. You know what I mean? Because labels is part of it. It says it right there. You got to have labels. Procedure. Remember, if a lot of kids get confused on this. You might want to write this down if you pulled up the lab file. Procedure means what you did in words. You say in words what you did. Calculations was where you actually show, here's how I constructed my formulas, because in this case, it's pretty much about making me three formulas in their domains. And then conclusion and reflection. The conclusion always needs to state, restate the actual conclusion. Here is my final product. And reflect on three math-centered things that you learned. And those can't be vagaries like I learned to use functions. And one of them can be how we could improve this lab. You don't have to do that, but that's if you're like running out of things you feel like you learned, then tell me how we could have made the lab better. Or maybe I will. I've taken some of those suggestions. Okay, so there's a description of the lab. When did you remember when I said the lab was due? Monday. That way, you don't have to stress about this between now and the test. And after the test, you have something you can do for your homework. Okay, so once you're done with the test on Friday, then you can go into full gear on getting this puppy done for Monday. All right? Okay. Now, uh, in our last few minutes, let's do a little bit more review. There was an easy kind and a hard kind of these. Uh, f times g of x, f plus g of x, f minus g of x. Those are all the easy kind. What was the hard kind for domain? Other than that one that has the nasty formula, there was one other kind that was tricky. f divided by g of x. On the first three, all you had to do was overlap the two parent number lines. f of x and g of x, they're domains. You just overlap them. But on this one, it had three number lines. The f number line, the g's domain, and one more thing. Do you remember? What was that one more thing that could go wrong and, cur and mess up your function, and therefore we need to factor it in into the domain? All right, so here's the f function. I'll keep it simple. Here's the G function. And what if I say the domain on this one has got to be X is greater than 5. And the domain on the blue one, normally you'd say it just can't be negative 4. But I'm going to say it's a given domain that X has to be greater than uh, That'll keep it from crashing also because then it'll, if it's really bigger than 2, it'll never be negative 4. So there are my two functions and domains have been given. Would you please figure out what is f divided by g of x and its domain? This is a typical you can do nothing else, figure out f divided by g of x.
figure out what those two functions come out to when you divide them. And yeah, you'd actually have to, you know, flip and multiply and like get them all multiplied out. Can't just leave it with a divide by bar. Good news for homework for tonight. The only thing that you have to do is clean up any old homework that you had. I'm not assigning anything new other than if I were you, I'd start the lab tonight. And if I were you, since I had nothing else to do tonight, you might want to do some top 20 review. Pick any of those that you're still pretty bad at. Practice those for a little bit. I know for some kids this means, cool, he didn't assign any homework. Okay, but then I hope you rock that top 20 test. If I could, I'd assign you each one problem, each of the ones that you don't know how to do well. Like you've got them wrong on past top 20. It would take me about three hours to like figure out exactly what that assignment is for everybody. So I can't do that. But you could do it pretty easy. You could look at your last top 20, find the ones you got wrong, make yourself do them. That takes some self-discipline. Here's the function, 3x minus 2. That was the f function. Now I'm dividing by the g, which is x over x plus 4. Can I leave it that way? Nope. You have to actually multiply it all out. So I'm going to take this and say 3x minus 2 over 1, which is what its denominator is in the first place, and times it by, flip this over, x plus 4 over x. See what just happened there? That was a flip and multiply. Now... That times that will make 3x squared. That was the first. The outside's going to be plus 12x. The inside's going to be minus 2x. And the last is going to be minus 8. And it's all over x. And then it'd be nice if I put these together and said 10x. Raise your hand if you had that one right. Okay, cool. Now, how do I do its domain? There's three number lines. The two are the obvious ones, f of x and g of x. Here's the f of x one. I'm going to make a number line for f of x. Domain of f was 5 and bigger. Can't be 5, though. Okay, g of x domain, domain of g, is bigger than 2. Here's 2. Can't be 2. Bigger than that. Now, if it was just those two overlapping, I would say it would be 5 and bigger. Here's the domain. The things that would work would be 5 and bigger. Not 5 itself. Bigger than 5 is the way I should say it. But there's a third one. And that third one is that the g function cannot be allowed to be 0. Is there a way that the g function could be 0? What could go into the g function that would make it be 0? Not make it crash, but make it be 0. If you let x equal what? zero. If you let x equal zero, then the g function becomes zero. Normally, is it a problem for the g function to be zero? No. But since it's on the denominator, now it is a problem. So the third number line is that g cannot be allowed to be equal zero. So what would make that happen? Zero would make that happen. So it can't be allowed to be zero. But every other number would be okay. And I know you're thinking, but you know, Mr. Server, negative four wouldn't be okay. That's handled already up in here on the D of G. Negative 4 wasn't going to, like, it was already okay. It was already taken care of by the blue one. So all you have to worry about for the third number line is what would make it crash. And 0 wasn't going to be in our domain anyway. So it turns out 
that it's still just five and bigger is where they all overlap. So your final answer on this one is just five and bigger, which I'd say five comma infinity, like this. So in this case, our third number line thing didn't even make it change. Usually it makes it change. All right. That covers a wide-ranging review of lots of things that you'll need to know for Friday's test. Um, your lab, I know you're leaving in a couple of minutes, so I don't mind if you pack up. That's okay. Your lab is going to be um, uh, due on Monday. Honestly, get started on it while it's fresh. I just told you how to do it. Three days from now, you wait till this weekend, you're going to be like, what did he say about the lab again? I guess you could always watch this video. Okay. But uh, last but not least, take a few minutes to study the top 20 tonight. Tomorrow I am going to be assigning you something. So since tonight is pretty light, good night to get this stuff done. That's all I got for you for today.